All right, today is another edition of the Career Channel, and today I have the pleasure of having Dr. Josh Shapiro and Sarah Burns, and Sarah Burns is the Director of Research and Evaluation at the San Diego Workforce Partnership, and Josh Shapiro is the Assistant Dean of Innovation and Research Affairs at UC San Diego Extension, and our topic today is going to run data, and we'll be having a conversation around their current research and evaluation roles in the respective uh, workforce that they serve. And more specifically, uh, we're going to start talking about why data is imp important. We're going to talk about uh, some of the trends and things that are going on right now. And um, sometimes we start off with a quote uh, that I've talked to Dr. Shapiro in the past about, in God we trust and the rest bring data. And then most recently, Jeffrey Moore talks about without big data, you are blind and deaf and in the middle of the freeway. So today, as we begin our conversation, I just want to start with you, Sarah, and in the middle of our pandemic and uh, so many different uh, decision makers looking at data to uh, make decisions, how's, how's this landscape changed for you or has it? It's changed a lot, Ed. One of the things that we're working around right now is that the typical economic signals that we look at, especially when looking at the workforce, are not real-time signals. We look at monthly reports for labor market data for unemployment. We look at quarterly census of businesses to look at who they're employing. And in some cases, we look at annual data. So when we're in a situation like this, where situations are changing on a day-to-day, -day, if not hourly basis, our traditional sources of information aren't as useful as they typically would be. So we have to look at what we can do in real time. And so another data source that we use and we look at, for example, is um, we have certain tools that scan online job postings to give us a sense of where is employment happening. We have data from businesses who submit layoff notices to us so that we can be looking at what industries are being affected the most so we can target who we're going to work, work with and what um, individuals need the most assistance to become reemployed. So it's really focusing, um, really putting a hyper focus on those data sources that can be a little bit more real time. So that's been the biggest adjustment for us, I think, right now. That's so important, but I was just going to turn, turn to you, Josh, and say, what your perspective on complementing the workforce? Yeah, I think that, you know, what Sarah brought up is a really good point, that the typical tools uh, don't work uh, in the same regard uh, during these unprecedented times. And so we have to look for more innovative uh, ways that data can help us understand what's currently happening and what's likely to happen in the future. So um, I, I, I definitely agree with everything she said. And, and I would also add that there's, there's a way to pull out um, cultural, emotional uh, aspects to what businesses are feeling and what they're experiencing. Uh, which can augment and enhance uh, burning glass and uh, MZ data, as well as Bureau of Labor Statistics. So if we know that companies are fearful about hiring, if they feel uncertain about what their revenue cycle is going to look like over the coming year, they're going to be a lot less inclined uh, to be posting jobs. And so by uh, trying to get a pulse of where companies are, we can triangulate different data sources to better understand the likely outcome. Right, and I'm sure this is gonna be really key and we'll get to a little bit about decision-making by leadership, but both Sarah and Josh, your relationship is intertwined. You've had one part of the workforce and then uh, I'll pivot to you just to expand. Uh, Sarah just talked about uh, pulling data and, and all the different impacts that's occurring right now. How does that impact the role of education as we start looking to the future? That's a really good question. And we've worked um, at UCSD with the San Diego Workforce Partnership for a number of years. And so I think we're actually really well positioned in times like this to respond quickly and cohesively. Uh, so to, to answer your question, we began using the framework of SDWP and their priority sectors to better understand the economy in San Diego um, and our role uh, in, in helping to upskill and train individuals uh, for jobs that are likely going to be paying a livable wage, uh, that are growing, 
um, in, in that can serve the entire community of San Diego. And so by really looking at data uh, and using that to focus how an education and training provider is able to fulfill a need and a gap within a community, I think that uh, connection and that synergy between UCSD and the San Diego Workforce Partnership is critical. Yeah, I mean, I agree entirely with that. And what's interesting is we've gone back and revisited what we call our priority jobs list. And we call it priority jobs and not in-demand jobs because we feel like demand connotates something very specific. Somebody wants this. But really, when we are looking at our priority sectors and where we want to help people get trained and employed, it's more than just demand, which is sort of the availability of a job. We also want to look at reliability. So is that job, does it have a future? And we want to look at profitability. So is somebody going to make a self-sufficient wage after they've gone through the effort to become trained in an occupation? So those are some of the criteria we use to look at those priority jobs. And even in this time, the priority jobs that we look at are ones that we still feel are strong and are the ones that should be prioritized when we're looking at helping people to think long term about their career pathways and where they might go. So creating data and, and reports on topics like that help to inform our education partners in focusing their resources in the areas that are going to be lasting and impactful for the people who are coming through and not just reacting to the demand of um, of the employers out there. That's great. And, I, you know, it occurs to me as you're talking, workforce is so broad because it's changed so much now that uh, we have a pandemic. There's different segments. So I, I would imagine both of you are starting to look at how does this impact high school students getting ready to go on into college or the workforce or how does the undergraduate finishing up their degree, going through their Zoom graduation or what have you, or current workers that have been laid off or in, in industries that have been so impacted? Is it uh, one of your approaches to start looking at uh, segmentation about how this impact and how the data impacts in each of these markets? And what does it look like in the future, how you're going to start addressing and looking at that? Yeah, so, so uh, again, a really important question. Uh, when we look at broad trends, we miss a lot of uh, the important components, the underlining aspects, how this pandemic is affecting different populations in, in very serious uh, ways. And so we know from the data um, that low income earners are more severely impacted uh, they're not, uh, it's, it's not as easy for all those occupational categories to be able to work from home. And so there's certain things that we have to be able to look at in terms of more nuanced data um, that, that, that really does focus on population specific aspects. The, the, the other thing that I wanted to mention is we can pull a lot of data um, around what jobs you're likely to be able to work from home what jobs are going to be less likely impacted um, from this current pandemic. And so one of the important components of what a workforce partnership and an education and training provider such as UCSD is able to do in times like this is to really hyper focus on those populations and those jobs that are, are that we know are going to be more severely impacted and look for uh, upskilling and training opportunities to take those skills somebody had in a job that may not exist in, uh, in a month, in two months, in four months, and start that cycle a little bit earlier of training and upskilling so we don't have all of this unemployment hitting uh, as it currently is. That's a great perspective, uh, Josh. And for Sarah, so we have all this data now and we're starting to look to the future. I can only imagine, uh, now you're connected with a lot of policymakers, a lot of leadership throughout San Diego, the federal level. Let's talk about how you use data to inform decision makers, because as we look across the country, data can be used in a lot of different ways. So it's not only how this is going to be used, but let's talk about integrity and transparency and the risks associated with data, because as we look forward, this is going to, they're going to be looking to both you and Josh and others for data, but how that's used, especially in your area, sorry, for policymakers for as we move forward. What are your thoughts around uh, 
transparency and the use of data and how's it go about that you uh, or how do you actually connect with leadership to make decisions? Mm -hmm. So a great question, Ed. And I think with our type of data, there's fewer situations where people are trying to do malicious things with our data, right? And twist it in a way that's going to tell the wrong story. But there are a lot of opportunities for misinterpretation um, and not understanding. For example, a really good one right now is that when we get the monthly unemployment numbers out, the March unemployment data didn't reflect most of the catastrophic impact we saw in the economy in March, because that's a survey that's taken during one week in the month that includes the 12th of the month. And that was before most of the impacts happened in March. So that data comes out in April and the unemployment rate looks like it went up, you know, 1%. It's not that huge of a difference. I mean, you know, kind of a big deal, but not that huge. Um, but the, the story isn't in alignment with reality sometimes. So what's important to us when we're communicating information like that is to make sure that policymakers or anybody who's trying to use this data understands the nuance and understands what the data can tell you and what the data can't tell you. Um, so that's, that's the biggest priority. In general, in terms of how we connect with those policymakers, we have regular check-ins with the staffers of our elected officials locally so that we can give them regular briefings on what's happening in our workforce, what the data looks like, and both in the economy in general, in specific topic areas. Um, we have briefings that look at things like what's happening with our justice-involved population so that they can also, going back to the last question, create policy and make decisions informed by what's happening with specific populations that might need additional support. So it's all in the interest of, again, accuracy and, um, and open communication and, and keeping those communication lines clear. Ed, could I just jump in there? I, I'd, I'd like to double down on something um, that Sarah mentioned that I think is a critical point. And that is, in, and again, you're speaking to two data nerds, uh, but there is, in this current situation, there is a lot of unknowns. There's a lot of things that data won't be able to tell us um, that we're, we're, we're unclear and uncertain about. And so I think it's important as we move forward, as people are using the best data that is available to understand the current situation, that there are uh, unknowns for, for lots of people uh, that, that, that involve data, that involve policy, that involve health and you know epidemiological responses. And so I think, you know, as Sarah had had said earlier, things are changing hourly. Um, and so it's important for the the larger economic workforce community to understand that data can only tell us so much. Um, and it's still critical and it's important. And again, we're we're we're, we're both heavily invested in that data. But I do think um, during this time, it's important to recognize that there still are a lot of unknowns that, that, that we will not uh, have answers to. I, I can uh, I think you make a great point, Josh, and the unknown is that 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 uh, elephant in the room. But, um, you know, another area that's come up recently is when we, this first surfaced. It, it's amazing. It was only a couple months ago that we had to make a, a pivot. And there were so many folks, uh, educators, industry, uh, going to Zoom, uh, go to meeting, and all these online platforms. And uh, I shudder to think 10 years ago, what would it look like if we didn't have these vehicles? But now we're finding in some schools this notion that we're going to pivot online. Uh, Zoom's now uh, turned into maybe a, a, a cross to bear. It's not as uh, all as it could be. In fact, we're finding more reports and some people talking about Zoom fatigue or the loss of socialization. Let's talk about a little bit from your perspective about as we move forward, it's not just remote learning, but how do we go about really starting to assess and using data to help us understand how to balance just the overall psyche and the approach to making sure that we have a, it's not just workforce and getting work done, but how do we measure just quality of life and adjustment? Yeah, I think that's a really important component as we 
um, have kind of been forced into a different model of work that most of us uh, are very inexperienced at, there's going to be huge transitional periods. And some of it uh, is going to be positive and some of it will be negative. Um, and, 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 and what I think is important for companies and businesses uh, to recognize is that, th you know, individuals weren't just going to work for productivity to knock out the next report. There was a social component. There was a sharing component. There was a mission and vision alignment between individuals and humans interacting. And some of that has obviously been lost uh, with the current situation. And I think by, um, you know, conducting surveys, understanding how people are feeling, how they can best be supported, we're going to enter a new uh, phase of, um, you know, business and management uh, data collection around how to integrate uh, uh, lifestyle and work in a totally unprecedented way. And there's tools out there to help facilitate those things. One thing that we've been talking and thinking and acting a lot around at the Workforce Partnership is job quality. And the idea that um, really every job can be a quality job. Um, doing a lot of education to help both job seekers and employers to see where they can improve um, in their relationship with each other. And so there's tools that allow employers to collect information from their employees to show the picture of the job quality in their, their workplace. And so I think there's um, a whole framework that we've thought through in terms of how to define job quality, but this aspect of it I think is going to be even more important now in terms of I can communicate and feel valued um, at my workplace and that social connection, it's gonna be different. Another thing that I think is going to be really interesting about how the workplace evolves after this pandemic um, is in how we continue to operate remotely. I think there are many companies and just people who have been really dragging their heels in terms of getting on board with working remotely or flexible schedules. Um, and using technology like this, either it was foreign and scary or seemed like, no, we couldn't possibly do work if we're not in the office together. So it sort of pushed the economy forward into this, what I think is going to be the next generation of our workplaces. And um, I think it'll be really interesting to see what remains in place uh, and to what degree people are just reverting back to pre-pandemic um, exercises and practices. Um, I've already heard of workplaces that have already decided that for um, the foreseeable future forever, they plan on having only a couple of days in the office per person, reducing their footprint and having people, you know, hotel at desks instead of having an assigned workplace. So I think there's a lot of changes to come um, still. And I think it's 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 unfortunate that it took a pandemic for this type of experimentation to occur. Um, there's obviously negatives uh, in terms of you know not feeling that social connection, but there are a ton of positives. And 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 one of the stats that I actually just saw was the suicide rate in Japan uh, has been plummeting since the the pandemic began, and this was attributed to not working as uh, uh, insane hours in the office all day, every day, which had been part of their culture. And it was, you know, the article talked about experiencing family life, enjoying time together, even, even, you know, in a forced trapped environment, but that ability to like think outside of how do you integrate work, uh, life balance, you know, it's forcing people to reconceptualize a lot of these notions. And I also think to Sarah's point, management, uh, is seeing that productivity and other aspects can still occur while increasing quality of life. And so there is this balancing act between what will it look like in the future. And when we think about in data points, I think that will be interesting to watch around those dynamics and how they change. Um, I'm particularly curious to see uh, what happens with workforce participation rates 
um, what happens with workforce participation rates for women in particular. So when childcare needs are um, potentially removed or um, accounted for, assuming that in some way we students go back to schools um, and there's more flexibility in a parent's schedule, who are we allowing to participate in the workforce who would have been tied to their children's schedules instead who may want to? Lots of people will choose not to participate in the workforce and that's fine, but I would, I'm interested to see how that balance plays out. I think you bring up a great point. I was just leading in, uh, Sarah, because uh, there's two things that come to mind with both you and Josh as we uh, wrap up today. One is that it's not just about decision makers, but our telecommuting policies, our HR policies, how we review and how uh, how it was unconscionable <laughs> or even thought about it years ago, uh, now has put, thrust us into rethinking everything we do. And I think I'd like to just go a little deeper. Uh, you started to talk about the family. How do you think, uh, or what are your thoughts around data and, and looking at, you know, now that we have uh, remote learning and we have uh, telecommuting through our, our vehicles, through our computers, do you think there's gonna be some significant impact on how we look at a family unit and how that looks uh, for the workforce? Maybe. I think another thing to keep in mind is that we're speaking, at least I'm speaking from a place of privilege where I have a job that has the possibility of being remote and offering flexibility and allowing me to re-envision family life differently. Um, and many, many people don't have access to that. So I think while we do evaluate what the world could look like differently and how people could reimagine um, family dynamics, I think it's even more important that we think about how we can extend those opportunities and those changes to people who are in occupations where that's not as possible. That's a good point. Now, Josh, I know you have your own family. You uh, work at the university. Just on a personal level, how has this impacted you as a dad and, and, your, and your own family now working from home? I mean, I think it, it, it goes back to what I said earlier, that uh, there's positives and negatives. So um, having having my kids around me all day is one of the most beautiful, hellish things I've ever experienced. Um, there's times where it, it is just so fun uh, and, and incredibly rewarding. And there's times where I am trying to get work done and the kids are screaming and yelling and fighting and she took that. And so, so again, it is a balancing act, but, but I think, I think what it forced me to realize is there's always been this separation between work and family. And I, I would go into work, um, and that was my time to get things done and I would come back and then I would be a father. And, and this, that, that this really reinforced that life is a lot messier than that. Uh, it's it's always been messy, but we've tried to separate these things, and 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 I think this said you know we 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 were forced into it, so there was no option. Um, but it said you have to take this messy, uh, confusing balancing act and find a way to make it beautiful. Find a way to be productive. Find a way to find the meaning in work, as well as being a father and a dad and a parent. You know all all of these things. And I think everyone is having to reimagine uh, what this looks like moving forward. And as Sarah pointed out, it's not the same for everyone. There's no silver bullet that says this is the way that it's going to be in the future. Um, management will have different ideas. I'm sure some will say as soon as, as soon as restrictions are lifted, everything's going back exactly the way it was. And others will say, hey, uh, we, we went through something together. Let's continue that journey. Let's experiment. Let's see what makes sense for our company and for our employees. And I think I'm excited from a data perspective to see how that all evolves. We could actually go on. And this is why you both as experts in your field, just uh, we uh, sure want to make sure you have an invite to come back and join us. Uh, I think uh, you are part of our tiger team of data. I mean, you say nerds, but our expertise is invaluable. Uh, both Sarah from the Workforce Partnership and Josh, UC San Diego, 
really appreciate your insights and uh, welcome you back to continue conversations throughout uh, this next year uh, around the Career Channel topics that we continue to uh, try to make sure we're relevant to what's going on in our world around us. And as you started to allude to both you and uh, you, Josh and Sarah, some of this data is a lot of nonsense and trying to make sense of it. We'll look to you for expertise to help guide us as we go through this process. Grateful to both of you. Thanks, Ed. Thanks for having us, Ed.